Hello, and thank you for joining us for episode 66 of the Aviation News Talk podcast, where we bring you, guess what, general aviation news and relevant information that pilots like you can actually use someday. Today, we're talking about a topic that a listener suggested, and that's tips and tricks for flying departure procedures, which are typically used by pilots flying IFR, but which can in some cases be used by VFR pilots as well. And we'll also be sharing listener feedback and answering listener questions. Plus, coming up in the news, we have an update with the other side of the story to that student pilot kidnapping that we talked about in episode 63. And the fight to save Santa Monica Airport just had another setback. And a major airline CEO spoke about the next steps in attempting to privatize air traffic control in the United States. And finally, there's a photo of a rumored new model being developed by one of the biggest GA aircraft manufacturers. Welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk about general aviation. I'm Max Trescott. I'm here to educate and inform you as a pilot or student pilot, and hopefully have some fun along the way. I'll talk about my over 40 years of experience as a certificated pilot. I'm author of the G1000 Glass Cockpit Handbook and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year, where I got to represent all 96,000 CFIs here in the U.S. These days, I'm a specialist in Cirrus aircraft like the SR-20 and SR-22. Now, if you're new to our show, in episode 64, we sat down and talked with 2008 Mechanic of the Year, Mike Bush, about his transition from high-tech to maintenance, and about his latest book, Mike Bush on Engines. And in episode 65, we talked with Jason Blair about recent changes to the private instrument and commercial check rides. So if you missed either of those episodes, you may want to check them out. All this and more, and the news starts now. More information has come to light in the alleged kidnapping of a Chinese student by two top administrators of a Redding, California flight school. The attorney for one of the defendants disputed the abduction charge and instead said the two employees were taking the student to the airport for a flight home to China because he flunked his classes and his visa had expired. Quote, he was expelled from IASCO because he simply could not cut it, according to San Francisco attorney Naomi Chung. She represents Kelsey Hoser, the director of administration and secretary at IASCO. That Reading police arrested both Hoser, who's 50, and IASCO flight school general manager Jonathan McConkey, 48, at the Reading airport on May 25th on suspicion of kidnapping aviation student Tian Shu Chris Shi. She told police he was taken against his will from his apartment and put in a van by McConkie and Hoser en route to the airport for a flight to China. She contacted a relative in his home country during the ordeal, who then alerted police. There are a number of reasons why the flight school wanted to send Shi home, Chung said in her comments that shed light on the case from the defendant's point of view. According to Chung, Shi's visa to attend vocational school had expired and he was failing at the flight school. In addition, Chung said she had failed all of his ground school and first simulator test. Of his 23 attempted lessons, eight received unsatisfactory grades and 10 were given incompletes. An inability to communicate with air traffic control was flagged as a major safety concern. She has said in a previous interview with a record searchlight that he never had an issue with his flight skills but thinks he was excused from training because of his English. Quote, I can't speak English well in life, but I can speak English well with air traffic control, he told a reporter. But Chunk said she's inability to communicate with air traffic control was a major concern. Quote, no one wants an unsafe pilot if something was to go wrong, she said. Chung said the flight school worked with Shi to improve his aviation skills and provided one-on-one -on -one instruction to help him. Chung also said employees heard Shi had become suicidal and upset. Quote, it's our belief that Mr. Shi was terrified to return home after failing school. The record recently posted a video of a lawyer for general manager Jonathan McConkie who said, My client believes there's been a rush to judgment and that this is not a kidnapping. Now, on the crawl, on the text on the bottom of the video, which was posted on June 6th, it said that Reading Police have sent the case to the district attorney's office, but that as of yet, McConkie and Hoser have not been charged with any crimes. From avweb.com, an update on Santa Monica Airport. Efforts to save the embattled Santa Monica Airport suffered a setback earlier this month when a court denied an NBAA petition claiming the FAA exceeded its authority when it agreed to allow the city to shorten the airport's single runway last year. NBAA had petitioned the court to vacate the 2017 agreement, arguing that the FAA defied requirements set by Congress, as well as the agency's own responsibility to support aviation. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia denied the petition on procedural grounds. 
quote, we're obviously disappointed by this decision, but it's important to note the court did not make a determination as to the merits of our arguments against the validity of the original settlement agreement, according to NBAA President Ed Bolin. He said this ruling was purely a matter of procedure and in no way does it establish a precedent by which the FAA may enter into similar agreements affecting the fates of other vital GA airports. NBAA is also involved in a pending administrative complaint that claims the city violated its grant-based obligations to the airport. As allowed by the agreement with the FAA, the city shortened Santa Monica's runway from 4,900 feet to 3,500 feet in a successful effort to reduce jet traffic at the airport late last year. The city has said its plans to close the airport by the end of 2028. According to NBAA, it will continue to pursue options for keeping the airport open. From generalaviationnews.com, a coalition of 11 GA advocacy groups have expressed concern over the potential impact to GPS systems from a proposed broadband cellular communications network operating within the same frequency bands currently used by GPS. A prior attempt to implement a high-speed nationwide cellular network by Legato Networks, formerly known as Light Squared, revealed signals from its cellular towers significantly disrupted aircraft navigation systems. The FCC ultimately denied Light Squared's plans in February 2012 following a strong chorus of opposition from the aviation industry, including the industry-wide coalition to save our GPS. Legato claims it has since limited GPS signal disruptions to within a 500-foot diameter around transmission towers, which the company maintains should mitigate interference concerns. However, the aviation groups noted those assertions have not been validated through evaluation of various operational scenarios by the FCC and FAA, adding, quote, significant safety concerns still have not been addressed in a letter that was sent to the FAA. Heidi Williams, who's director for air traffic services and infrastructure for the National Business Aviation Association, emphasized the importance of GPS navigation, not only for pilots, but for the entirety of the FAA's next-gen air transportation system. Quote, despite offering several benefits to operators, such as the potential for enhanced communications and flight tracking, it would be irresponsible to deploy Legato's proposed network without clear and indisputable third-party validation that it does not interfere with GPS. She continued, the potential for harmful consequences to pilots, passengers, and citizens is simply too great. And there's a long list of associations, including uh, the Airline Pilots Association, ALPA, AOPA, and others who are opposed to the proposal. From AOPA.org comes word that relief may be in sight for airports affected by TFRs. On June 7th, the Senate Appropriations Committee approved its fiscal 2019 transportation spending bill, which among other priorities designates $3.5 million to help airports in Florida and New Jersey deal with the financial impacts caused by presidential temporary flight restrictions. The Senate bill comes on the heels of similar action in the House Appropriations Committee in early June, where $3.5 million amount was approved. The funding is intended to help local airports that are located within the TFR no-fly zone when the president travels. That would be Solberg and Somerset airports in New Jersey and Florida's Lantana Airport. Combined, these three airports suffered a net loss of nearly $1 million in 2017 alone. Extended presidential TFRs often severely impact airport businesses such as flight schools, maintenance shops, and other aviation-related operations. The Senate bill brings this relief one step closer to reality. The bill also requires an independent audit before airport sponsors receive any reimbursement. Upon passage of the two appropriation bills in their respective chambers, differences will be ironed out before being sent to the president for signature. From avweb.com, privatization fight continues. To no one's surprise, those in favor of splitting air traffic control from the FAA are busy planning their next move. And that's something that Rob Mark and I predicted back in episode 54 when we did an update on ATC privatization. After a last-minute grassroots lobbying effort blocked an amendment snuck into the FAA reauthorization bill passed last month that would have laid legal groundwork for such a move, the CEO of the U.S.'s largest airline was musing about next steps in front of a friendly audience at the Economic Club of Washington earlier this month. EAA caught a story in Politico that quoted United Airlines CEO Oscar Munoz as saying it's already a topic of conversation when CEOs meet. Quote, the airline industry is trying to formulate what the next plan would be, Munoz told Politico. There's an outline coming together, but it'll be some time before we all get aligned around it. He further said that once the airlines decide what they want, they'll, quote, provide that input and then work with the government to make that move forward. 
Well, forewarned is forearmed, says EAA, and they said it's not going to be that easy. Quote, as EAA noted when the ATC privatization proposal in the House was withdrawn earlier this year, any celebration should be tempered with a guarded eye toward efforts by proponents to revitalize the efforts in the future, end of quote. As we've talked about many times on this show, the plan that's so far been thwarted involves setting up a not-for-profit corporation that raises its funding directly from those using the national airspace system. This user pay model is opposed by General aviation groups that say the resulting corporation will turn over control of the system to the airlines. Quote, EAA and other GA organizations support the continued modernization of the national airspace system, but not at the cost of equal access to the airspace or minimizing GA's important role within the nation's aviation infrastructure, EAA said in its report. In international news, this comes from electric.co, that's E-L-E-C-T-R-E-K, and that is a news site that tracks the transition from fossil fuel transportation to electric. Siemens, the electric plane prototype, caught on fire in the air before crashing and killing both occupants. They say electric flight had a major setback after a tragic fatal accident last month in Hungary. Now, this is one of the few all-electric aircraft prototypes that's in operation today. It's the Siemens and Magnus's E-Fusion, and it crashed during a test flight, killing both the pilot and the passenger. Uh, Electric first reported on Siemens' electric flight effort after the first version of the plane set records for top speed of 340 kilometers per hour, which is 211 miles per hour, and for the first electric aero tow last year. The aircraft was used near a Magnus facility outside Budapest when the accident happened. Magnus said in a statement about the accident, quote, On May 31st, a Magnus E-Fusion experimental aircraft took off at 10.10 a.m. and while completing its test flight, due to yet unknown reasons and circumstances, crashed into the cornfield. As a consequence of this, both the pilot and the passenger of the aircraft lost their lives. Now, aviation website AvWeb reported, quote, witnesses reported seeing the aircraft maneuvering at low altitude before catching fire and crashing in a near vertical dive. Now, Siemens was testing high-power density electric motors and energy density batteries in the aircraft. The motor installed in the prototype last year had a power output of 260 kilowatts and a weight of just 110 pounds. It was also equipped with a number of lithium-ion battery modules in the front of the aircraft. Now, Electric says that their take on this is that if the plane indeed caught on fire in the air, the batteries will certainly be a major suspect in the investigation Battery fires are already a major concern for fuel-powered aircraft, and it was anticipated that electric planes would face an uphill battle in being accepted because of that as well. Well, I must say that I've been very enthusiastic about electric aircraft, and I hadn't really thought about the potential for fire because I know uh, various forms of lithium-powered batteries uh, can get very uh, flammable, especially if their uh, seals are breached and they're exposed to oxygen. They become uh, you know, raging fire. So this is something that manufacturers and pilots will have to continue to, uh, to address in the future. Also from Europe, from flyer.co.uk, that's Flyer Magazine, L3CTS opens Europe's biggest airline pilot academy. Over 300 days of sunshine a year makes central Portugal an ideal spot for VFR flight training, and that's one reason why L3 Commercial Training Solutions has settled on an airfield just out the little town of Pont de Sor for its new European Airline Academy. L3 acquired G-Air, the approved training organization, to previously occupy the site in January of this year and is busily rebranding the assets and aligning all its training materials. Pont de Sor Airfield has recently been spruced up with the help of an EU grant, and it hosted the Portugal Air Summit at the end of May. It's located in Class G airspace, has its own tower, an 1,800-meter runway, a sizable apron, and two large hangars, maintenance, and an ILS L3 is expanding its fleet at Pontesor to include 12 Diamond DA-40s and four single-engine Cessnas. The first two have already arrived and will go into service immediately, providing ab initio training for the first batch of cadets from L3's UK Airline Academy at Southampton. Once they've passed the VFR flying stage and obtained their private pilot's license, the cadets will return to the UK for multi-engine and instrument rating training. From aeronews.net, swinging back here to the United States, Milton, Florida-based Part 141 Flight School, AMS Flight School, has partnered with SkyWest Airlines, that's the largest regional airline here in the U.S., to provide top-tier tuition reimbursement programs through SkyWest Pilots Pathway Program. Up to $27,500 from SkyWest Airlines is available to aspiring commercial pilots through this exciting new partnership. Students can apply now on the AMS Flight School website. Quote, there's never been a better time to become a commercial 
commercial airline pilot. The demand for pilots is strong, and our rotor transition program with SkyWest offers helicopter pilots a tremendous opportunity to cover their transition training from rotor to fixed-wing aircraft, said Christopher Schultz, chief flight instructor at AMS. He said, we are extremely pleased to be selected as a preferred partner school by SkyWest Airlines. This validates the exceptional track record of AMS and the superior flight instruction we provide to our career-minded students. Now, military rotor pilots who choose to complete their fixed-wing training at AMS can enjoy up to $27,500 in tuition reimbursement and bonuses from SkyWest. The rotor transition program is designed to provide a clear pathway for military helicopter pilots to launch their career as an airline pilot with SkyWest. Through this partnership, the airline is offering AMS students $20,000 in tuition reimbursement and a $7,500 bonus for military pilots. For those who are not transitioning through the Rotor program, AMS also offers top-tier tuition reimbursement through SkyWest Pilot Pathway Program with up to $17,500 of tuition reimbursement. Joining the SkyWest Pilot Pathway provides AMS students with SkyWest Pilot Mentors, enhanced company seniority, benefits, and a guaranteed final interview and more. And I should just mention that in episode 380 of the Airplane Geeks about two and a half years ago, we interviewed Tracy Gallo, vice president of SkyWest, and he said at that time there has never been in history a better time to become an airline pilot. Yeah, that certainly seems to be the case. A friend of mine, by the way, who is in his 60s, uh, just got uh, hired on for a training class at Sky West, so all kinds of opportunities out there. And finally, this comes from Flyer Magazine. Has a new Cirrus SR-18 been spotted? Well, apparently a Cirrus that has been unmarked other than its registration number has been spotted by U.S. enthusiasts at the Duluth, Minnesota Airport, which is the headquarters of Cirrus. The story also says the aircraft has been tracked on Flight Radar, which I think is the Flight Radar 24 app. The aircraft is on the FAA registry as an EX-18, which suggests it's an experimental prototype for a new model, perhaps an SR-18 with a 180-horsepower engine. The aircraft appears to have a larger empennage, suggesting it could be used for intentional spinning. All of this is speculation, of course, but it could be that Cirrus has an aircraft destined for the training market. No surprise, since they're currently owned by uh, Kaiega, which is a Chinese company, and there's an unprecedented demand in Southeast Asia for airline pilots. Now, you may remember way back in 2009, Cirrus did have a uh, light sport aircraft program under development that was going to be the Cirrus SRS, but it was canceled back in 2009. Now, the story says producing a two-seater or better still a three-seater with a 180 horsepower engine for lower fuel burns capable intentional spinning for upset training market would give Cirrus a strong contender in the training market that they say is currently dominated by the Piper PA-28 Warrior and the Diamond DA-40. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up, we're going to talk about departure procedures, what they are, and also the potential gotchas when using them plus listener feedback and questions. One longtime pilot wants to know how has flight training changed over the years? And a student pilot wants to know about T-routes and whether a VFR pilot can fly them. Stick around. We'll be right back here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And welcome back. In a moment, I'll be talking about departure procedures. But first, let me give you a few quick updates. Now, I've been traveling a lot lately. I've had two trips since our last regular news show in episode 63. And a trip going out to Knoxville was kind of interesting. It was uh, on a United flight. Uh, the client had uh, used his miles to get me a first-class ticket, which I thought was nice to get me out to Knoxville. And since it had to be on United, we went through O'Hare and then made a connection to uh, Knoxville from there. Now, unfortunately, my uh, United flight to O'Hare diverted. We were supposed to be uh, landing at about the same time. There was a little teeny tiny thunderstorm uh, over the airport. And I know that because I was looking at four flight and it was pretty tiny. And we were in a hold for a while. And then out of an abundance of caution, they diverted us to Des Moines to pick up more fuel. We were on the ground there for you know, 45 minutes to an hour. But of course, it was just long enough to miss my connection in Chicago. Fortunately, I had picked 
a route where there was yet another flight uh, later in the day, but all told I had to wait about six hours. So it became about a 14 and a half hour uh, trip from San Francisco to Knoxville. But in spite of that, the best part of that was spending perhaps a half hour or so talking with Chastain. He is a Republic uh, Airlines first officer based out of uh, Indianapolis, been working for them for about a year, as I recall. And he says he really likes working for Republic. He was in the O'Hare terminal waiting to uh, fly a flight back to Indianapolis, which is his home base. He's a lucky guy. He chose to live in the city where he's based. Uh, so his trips start there and end there. Uh, so he doesn't have to do commuting to get to uh, where he needs to start his trips, which is great. He said he really enjoys flying the Embraer, likes it much better than the CRJ that's flown by some of the other airlines. And he particularly liked uh, Republic because he flies some longer leg lengths. He's got friends who started about the same time at SkyWest and Envoy, both the regional airlines. So he keeps tabs on what they're doing. And he told me he had been teaching previously down in Denton, Texas at a large flight school there that I have visited a couple of times in the past. And he also said that he got a signing bonus uh, when he uh, signed on at uh, Republic. I didn't ask him what his salary was, and he didn't offer it, and that's fine. Uh, it was kind of interesting. There's an article that I just saw within the past few days at the Kansas City Star, and their uh, newspaper has their online presence at Kansas City. Dot com. This article says airlines are clamoring to hire K-State graduates and reverse pilot shortage. That would be uh, Kansas State University, which I have uh, visited their uh, aviation program in the past. And they talk about a gentleman there named Mitchell who had recently joined Republic Airlines. And way down at the bottom of the article, they talk a little bit about salaries. Uh, they said that uh, first officer with Republic earns an annual salary of 58000 to 64000 And then they have a U.S. Labor Department statistic that the median yearly wage for commercial pilots was $78,000 in May of 2017. And I think I mentioned before on the show, this is a far cry from the roughly eighteen to 20000 that pilots were getting paid probably as little as four years ago at the regional airline. So I'm just delighted to see that the regionals, for whatever reason, are now uh, paying a decent starting salaries. So that's great. Well, when I got to Knoxville, we were there to pick up a brand new uh, Cirrus SR-22, fly it back to Salinas, California, which is right next to the Monterey Bay. And while we were there, I got to see, lo and behold, the new building, uh, which was just a, a drawing when I was there a year ago, but the building is now up. And that's going to hold the simulator uh, for their Cirrus jet. So currently, all type ratings uh, for people who buy Cirrus jets are done in the jet, which is obviously expensive to do. Uh, but the new simulator is there, and it's kind of neat the way they've constructed the building. Uh, there's glass all around this full motion simulator, which uh, costs them millions of dollars. And if you're on the outside of the building, you can watch that simulator uh, in motion as it's being used. And the expectation is that it will get certified sometime in the coming month or so, at which point uh, all future type ratings for the Cirrus jet will be done in the simulator. And I think that's going to increase their capacity because uh, obviously they can run that around the clock and be uh, teaching people, you know, in the middle of the night if they uh, need to. So it was fun to actually see that simulator uh, finally up and running. Our trip home in the Cirrus was pretty uneventful. It's nice to have uh, a trip where everything goes well without uh, any unusual kinds of things. Uh, we did have one funny conversation that we overheard. We were on frequency uh, with Memphis Center. Now it's kind of funny because Memphis Center, someone from there just left a review for our podcast here a couple of weeks ago. So hopefully they hear this. It was on 124.35. I tried to find this on liveatc.net, but that particular frequency is not recorded. But I did spend a lot of time transcribing it so that I got it. Uh, correctly. Uh, basically, Center called uh, an aircraft. They said, Red Stripe 485, do you want a shortcut or stay on route? And uh, the Red Stripe 485 said, shortcuts are wonderful. And Memphis Center then said, I've never heard of anyone wanting to get to Midland that fast, clear, direct to Midland. And then the pilot said, I ate too much and I'm ready to take it down. So anyway, kind of a cute conversation. It would, <laughs> would have been even funner just uh, listening to it uh, on the audio. I've got to start recording my flights, I think, just so that I have the, uh, the audio of those kinds of things. So anyway, great trip uh, back from uh, Knoxville. And then a few days later, I headed out to Missoula, Montana. I mentioned that uh, on the show previously. Uh, that was my 50th state. I flew up on a Thursday, and the weather was just spectacular. It was fun going up on Sky West, uh, landing there in the middle of the day. Huge, big, uh, bright 
uh, puffy clouds against a blue background. And I know for folks in the Midwest and other places, you see that all the time. Here in California, I'm looking up right now and it's a pure blue sky. We just don't get that many clouds in the summertime. So it was a uh, fun being up there to attend the AOPA regional fly-in. On Friday, I taught a seminar on advanced IFR for three hours, and that was attended by probably 45 to 50 people, which I think is a pretty good turnout uh, for uh, you know one of the smaller shows up in the northwestern part of the country. Weather, again, was uh, not bad on Friday. It was a little overcast. On Saturday, unfortunately, the rain started coming down. It was wet all day long, so I'm sure that uh, kept attendance down a little bit. Uh, but the best part of Saturday was that my wife flew in uh, again on that same SkyWest flight, uh, arriving sometime after noon. Uh, it was a little exciting watching that arrival. Uh, that flight came in on the VOR Bravo approach, which comes in at an angle, and then you have to maneuver to uh, land on runway 30. The minimums on that uh, our approach are about 1,700 feet AGL, so you break out fairly high. On the other hand, the current METAR at that time said that the airport was 5,500 overcast. Well, the clouds were uh, much lower than that. I saw the jet pop out directly over top of the uh, field, and I heard him report that he didn't see the airport and was unable to maneuver to land. Uh, they then went around, vectored him 25 miles out to join the 25 DME arc for the ILS-1-2. They landed with a 7-knot tailwind, which I think was excellent judgment. The ILS, of course, gets them into a much lower uh, minimum altitude, and landing with a tailwind is not that big a deal, especially when you have a, a nice long runway. So I was happy that the pilot made what I thought was a great uh, judgment uh, decision, though I'm sure it was a heavy workload for him. My wife and I then went up to Glacier National Park, where we spent three days in the park. The uh, park is notable for having a number of glaciers, which unfortunately are all on the east side. And the going to the Sun Highway is not yet fully plowed. Uh, and so even here at, uh, what, June 21st, there's still snow that hasn't yet been plowed out. So we stayed on the west side of the park. A couple of highlights, we did ride in their red buses. They have a fleet of buses that date back to 1936 and 1937 that are still in service, uh, wooden frames, and they're absolutely gorgeous. They've got canvas tops that you can roll back so you can, uh, you know, watch the, uh, the scenery uh, out through the top. And we actually saw a couple of moose. So my first spotting of a moose. Uh, so that was kind of fun to visit my 50th state and spot a moose and get to uh, teach at AOPA. So all in all, a fantastic, very memorable trip to Missoula, Montana. And I'm about to head out and do it all over again. I'm leaving tomorrow morning on a Delta flight for Minneapolis. From there, I'll drive to Cumberland, Wisconsin, where I'm picking up a new SR-22. Actually, it's not new. It's a 2009, but I'll be with its new owner, who coincidentally is also named Max. And then we'll fly it back together here to California. He's not instrument rated, so he asked me to come along and help him bring the aircraft back. And that's just one of those things that I do. Uh, so speaking of which, if you are ever thinking of buying a Cirrus, whether it's new or used, definitely get in contact with me early because I can certainly help you in the acquisition process as well as uh, training and getting the aircraft back to home if you'd like. And longtime listeners know that if you enjoy the show and you're just looking for more, the place to go is our Patreon site. And over the last couple of weeks, I've posted a couple of news stories. Uh, one was a link to the updated private instrument and commercial ACSs, which we talked about in episode 65 with Jason Blair. You can find those out on our Patreon site. And also there is dash cam video of an aircraft that landed in Southern California on a highway. This is pretty spectacular. Occurred a few weeks ago in Huntington Beach, California. This You may have read about it in the news. This was a student pilot, a lady, I believe, and something happened with the engine, and she put it down on the highway very nicely. So the dash cam video is kind of fun to watch. That was rather interesting. The driver is a little whiny. <laughs> She's talking mostly about her rather than the person who just landed the airplane in front of her, which is kind of funny. Anyway, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters who've joined us here in the last couple of weeks. And they include Joseph Morales, Thomas Kalwasser, Michael Kennard, Anthony, Hillel Glazer, Heath Bauman, and Moj Cassie, who just increased his monthly donation. Thanks, everybody, for being a sponsor. And the place to find our page is just type into a web browser, aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, or go to aviationnewstalk.com, click on the top of the page where it says help the show. 
And since this is our first news episode of the month, I'm going to list all of our biggest supporters, those who contribute more than $20 each month. And a big thank you to Jeremy Zawadny, who's a software developer, Peter Long, who's a pilot in Australia, formerly a CFI who taught at the same club I teach in Silicon Valley. Seth Lake, he's a military instructor, pilot, and flight instructor in Arkansas. You can find out about his podcast and flight school at gonogo.aero. Jason Blair, he's a DPE pilot examiner. You can find his blog at jasonblair.net. Joseph Haggerty II, who's a Mooney pilot and owner. Michael Rogers, a Cirrus pilot and owner in Southern California. Also, Michael Spain, student pilot in Oklahoma, who's planning to buy a Cirrus. We'll have to find out if he's uh, passed his check ride yet. Larry Noe from New York, New York, the city. He flies a Bonanza G36. Carl and Ann Rossi of Maine Cooncat Aviation. They are the proud owners and operators of three, yes, three Cessna T240 aircraft. Roger Griggs, he's a turbine guy, has over 2,000 hours in his TBM 850, and he's just recently got a Meridian 600, now has over 100 hours in that. Troy Wistman, he's an IT guy down in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. He flies a Turbo 182 RG, and you can read about his plane and his charitable flying at Wistman, W-H-I-S-T-M-A-N dot com. Chuck Price, he's a manager with Too Simple. That's T U Simple. And you can go out to their website at toosimple.ai to learn about what they're doing with artificial intelligence with large tractor trailer trucks. Don Dillman, he's a professional pilot who runs a training center and he owns a Bonanza F 33A and he has just reinstated his CFI. Stella Sue, Stella's a student pilot in SR 20. She's a pilot flying. Uh, who I was with in a Facebook Live uh, video stream that we sent out. And you can find that video on our Patreon site. Jonathan Weisswasser, a vascular surgeon, also a ham radio operator like me. He flies a Meridian. And Jim Barath, he runs Sonics ESD. And he, by the way, was a person I just brought an airplane back from Knoxville with. He specializes in active noise control systems. So we had a lot of fascinating conversations as we flew back in his brand new SR-22. Fabio Kamlos, also an SR-22 owner. Lance Fletcher, he's a former crew chief in the Air Force on an F-111F. He says he wanted to learn to fly for a decade and has finally decided to take it up. So Lance, welcome to the flying club here. Joseph Morales, who is new and I have not spoken with yet. So we'll tell you more about Joseph uh, next month. And finally, Moj Kazi, who's a software developer here in the Silicon Valley. And again, if you love the show and want more, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, and you can help support the show. Now stick around, because in seven seconds, we're going to be talking about departure procedures, tips and tricks and gotchas, right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Welcome back. Hey, one of the things I love is when I hear from you, when you send me an email or you send me an audio recording and often you have suggestions for things to talk about on the show and I plug those in. Here's a recording I received from Brian, who's one of our Patreon supporters. This is Brian in Reston and I come to you with a suggestion for a subject for the podcast. You really do a great job with the podcast because you cover subjects that many of us may have learned about in the past, but we haven't thought about in a while. And we really need to pay attention to these and get back up to speed or or better understand what we're supposed to do and what we are doing. My subject uh, that I suggest is that of the standard instrument departure. Many times I have found I fly out of a non-towered airport on the East Coast in the SFRA area, but many times I find myself going into Teterboro or Raleigh-Durham or one of the other busy uh, big airports, and when I'm departing, the tower will often, much to my surprise, and in contrast to what I have filed for and asked for in my IFR flight plan, will give me one of their standard departures. And for the pilots who fly there all the time, these are perfectly normal and customary, and perhaps they know exactly what to do. I find myself struggling to find the chart, the the plate for it, and look up and see how this is going to work. And then usually not having any idea of how the tower will actually use that. I've had occasions once down, particularly down in Florida at Pompano Beach, when I was headed to the west coast of Florida, and they gave me a standard instrument departure that took me down towards Puerto Rico. And I was sort of flabbergasted. In the end, the tower controller said, don't worry, we aren't going to send you very far before we turn you west. 
But I didn't know that when he first gave it to me. And so I was sort of puzzled as to why am I being sent to Puerto Rico to go to Naples, Florida? Anyway, I would appreciate your spending a little time on standard instrument departures, how to use them, how to quickly perceive what their utility is and how they're probably going to be used at the airport and at the destination that you're headed for, even if they don't look logical. So anyway, that's my suggestion. And I thank you very much for a wonderful podcast. Brian, thanks so much for that great suggestion. And for everyone else listening there, if after you listen to this segment, you have any other additional suggestions for Brian on departure procedures, just send me your audio feedback. If you have an iPhone, you can just search on your phone for voice memos, which is an app that Apple installs on every iPhone. Or if you have Android, you'll find a similar voice recorder app. Then email the audio to me at info at sjflight. That's SJ short for San Jose flight.com. So now let's start talking about the basics of departure procedures. These are published sets of instructions that are designed for instrument pilots to use when they're departing mostly from larger airports. They're used to expedite departures and also simplify clearance delivery. Uh, And what that means is it saves you time spent talking on the radio, getting your clearance. And not only do they save time on the radio, but if there are obstacles, uh, terrain in the area, they provide you guaranteed clearance over those obstacles, even if you're in the class. Now, you don't have to be an instrument pilot to use them. They're especially handy for VFR pilots to use if you're departing at night, as they're going to guarantee that you clear all of the obstacles, something that you can't do yourself uh, just by looking out the window if it's a dark or overcast night with no moon. Now, to fly a departure procedure, you must have the published description of it, which is included with all instrument approach procedures, and these are the charts that are designed to let pilots descend safely through the clouds to their destination. Now, there are two sources for instrument charts. One is Jeppesen. They're now owned by the Boeing Corporation, and the other publisher of charts is the U.S. government. You know, the name for the U.S. government charts and the agency responsible for publishing has changed multiple times over the years. I think they're currently published by a group within the FAA. But as I mentioned, that department <laughs> kind of is a poor stepchild, gets tossed around a little bit. There is a third set of charts that are published by the Department of Defense. Those are primarily for military airfields. They used to be called FLIPS, F-L-I-P-S. I'm not sure if they still use that name, uh, but that's also a source of uh, instrument charts. Now, in the bad old days, which would be before the iPad was invented, pilots always relied on paper versions of the charts. And it was a bit of a pain to either have to buy a complete new set of charts from the U.S. government every 28 days, or if you had a subscription to Jeppesen, you had to get an update package in the mail that came every 14 days, and in it would be just the charts that had changed. And so you would sort through all of these. You'd open up your large uh, uh, multi-ring binder and pull out old charts and put in new charts, which always took a lot of time. So either way, it was a bit of a pain. Later on, AOPA published all of the U.S. government charts online for free if you were an AOPA member. And that's still a handy way even today to quickly download and print a small number of charts when you're on the ground before uh, flight. But it's not a good way to try and access the charts once you're in flight. Well, this all changed over 10 years ago when WingX created one of the first apps that lets you download all the instrument charts for the United States, first onto a laptop computer and later onto a Windows cell phone in the days before the iPhone was introduced. And I actually had one of those old uh, Windows uh, cell phones and used to use WingX. It was very handy to have all the charts. Now, after the iPhone was introduced, uh, what, around 10 years ago, uh, ForeFlight was released, and that's now the primary way that pilots in the U.S. carry instrument charts with them. Of course, there are now many apps that pilots can use that carry all the instrument charts, and they include things like Garmin Pilot, uh, which we talked about in episode 64. Now, many of these apps include the U.S. government charts for free, and some of them can also store the Jeppesen charts, that is, if you pay separately for a separate Jeppesen subscription. Now, let's talk a little bit about departure procedures. They are designed in accordance with, get this, the U.S. Standard for Terminal Instrument Procedures, which generally is shortened to TERPS, T-E-R-P-S. So that's just a set of standards used to construct instrument approaches. All departure procedures are based on an assumption that after an aircraft takes off, it will have reached a minimum height of 35 feet above the ground by the time it reaches the departure end of the runway. Now, from then on, it's mandatory for any airplane climbing in the instrument system to climb at a minimum rate 
of 200 feet per nautical mile for the first two miles. Now, note that I didn't say 200 feet per minute, but rather 200 feet per nautical mile. Of course, feet per minute is really easy to determine simply by looking at the vertical speed indicator in your airplane. But feet per nautical mile, we don't have an instrument for that. That requires some calculations to transform it into something useful when you're in the airplane. Now, here are a couple benchmarks that you can use. If you're climbing out at 120 knots, and that might be a typical climb speed for, well, let's say, a Cessna 210, a Bonanza, or a Cirrus SR-22, if you're climbing at 120 knots, then you are traveling two miles every minute. So if you have to climb 200 feet during the first nautical mile, and then another 200 feet during the second nautical mile, well, you've got to be climbing at a minimum of 400 feet per minute throughout your climb. And if you look at your vertical speed indicator, you should be reading a minimum of 400 feet per minute, provided you're climbing at right around 120 knots, in order to stay above the protected area afforded by the departure procedure. So it's pretty simple. If you're climbing around 120 knots, just double the 200 feet per nautical mile climb rate to get to the 400 foot per minute climb rate that you'd need to achieve. And knowing this is helpful because sometimes the departure procedure or even the missed approach portion of an instrument approach procedure will state that you need to climb out at a non-standard climb rate that is higher than the standard 200 feet per nautical mile climb rate. Now, here's an example. If you were to fly the Sunul 9 departure out of the San Jose International Airport and you were taking off from either runway 30 left or 30 right, you must be able to achieve a minimum climb rate of 480 feet per nautical mile from the surface all the way up through 4,000 feet. So if you're climbing at 120 knots, you just double that figure to calculate that you'll need to achieve a climb rate of 980 feet per minute or about 1,000 feet per minute in order to accept that departure procedure as part of your clearance. Now, obviously, noting those kinds of notes and those kinds of details are incredibly important. You want to thoroughly read a uh, departure procedure and never accept one that requires a climb rate that's higher than your airplane is able to achieve. Now, just to give you another benchmark, we looked first here at 120 knots. Imagine you're flying an airplane that climbs slower. Let's say it climbs out at 60 knots. Now, the VY climb speed of almost all airplanes is faster than that. Now, I have flown some older Diamond DA-40s with a VY climb speed of 64 knots, so it's not totally outrageous. So imagine if your climb speed is 60 knots, you're going to travel just one nautical mile per minute, and you'll need to climb 200 feet during that mile. So at 60 knots, you'll only have to climb at 200 feet per minute to achieve a 200 foot per nautical mile climb rate. Likewise, somewhere in the middle, if you're climbing out at 90 knots, well, then you're going to need a 300 foot per minute climb to achieve 200 feet per nautical mile. Now, when you are required to climb at 200 feet per nautical mile, those obstacles along your departure route are allowed to increase at a lower rate of 152 feet per nautical mile, which is a 40 to 1 obstacle slope. So you're climbing at 200 feet per nautical mile. The obstacles are climbing at 152 feet per nautical mile. Thus, this departure procedure is designed to increase your separation from obstacles below during the initial climb out. So the further you climb, the higher you get above the obstacles. Now, if any obstacle were to penetrate this 40 to 1 gradient or glide slope, if you will, special procedures apply, which would typically be a special climb gradient that's greater than the standard 200 feet per nautical mile climb rate or perhaps some turns to avoid the obstacles. All of this would be documented in the instrument departure procedure chart. Now, this is a good time to talk about takeoff minimums, which are kind of related. For large and commercial aircraft, standard takeoff minimums are one statute mile visibility for single engine and twins, and a half mile visibility for planes with more than two engines. Now, visibility is measured as being the greatest distance that uh, somebody up in the tower can see through at least half of the horizon. Now, these takeoff minimums just apply to commercial aircraft. For general aviation pilots flying Part 91, we have no published takeoff minimums. That means you can take off in zero, zero visibility. But just because it's legal doesn't mean it's safe. I have to admit, I have done it one time, and I will never do it again. Scariest darn thing I think I've ever done from an instrument standpoint, uh, taking off when you can barely find your way to the runway. 
Now, Brian mentioned in his recording that he sometimes struggles to find a DP chart. The the DP charts are always grouped with the associated airport uh, approach charts, both the Jeppesen and the government charts. And if you're using an app like ForeFlight, if you type in the airport identifier, that's going to take you to the airport information page. And then in ForeFlight, about a third of the way down the display, you'll click on the procedures tab. And below that, you'll find a line that says departures. Click on that and you'll find all the departure procedures. And if there happens to be an ODP. It'll also be listed there on the same area, but it'll be labeled takeoff minimums. Now, if you're issued a clearance with a DP, a pilot is obliged to comply and assure that the airplane performance meets the climb requirements. Of course, you must have a copy of the text or the graphical procedure in order to accept it. And if you're going to load it into your GPS, you've got to have a current database which has that departure in there listed by its name. Now, if you're unable to comply with a DP for any reason, you must refuse the DP. Now, Brian, here's a tip for you. You said that you're often surprised when a tower gives you a DP. If you don't want to use a DP, just type in no DP in the remarks section when you file an IFR flight plan. If you do that, the tower is obliged to give you some other set of instructions, such as an initial climb, heading, and altitude, instead of giving you a DP. And that could simplify life for you if you really don't want to use a DP. Now, there are two types of DPs. There are the obstacle departure procedures, known as ODPs. These are printed either textually or graphically, though I would say the vast majority of them are text or the standard instrument departures, or SIDs, which are always printed graphically. Now, if you're not assigned a graphic DP or other instructions, you can always use a textual ODP for obstacle clearance. Now, both types of DPs provide obstacle clearance protection to an aircraft in IMC, and they also reduce communication and uh, departure delays. Now, regardless of what kind of format you're using, all of these DPs provide a way to depart the airport and transition to the en route structure safely. And when possible, pilots really ought to consider flying a DP anytime they're flying at night, whether they're IFR or VFR, especially during, you know, marginal VFR type conditions when you can't see outside. Now, all DPs, whether they're textual or graphic, may be designed using RNAV. Now, for us GA pilots, RNAV means an instrument-capable GPS in the airplane. And if your approach is designed for that, you're going to see it in the title. For example, the SHEED-2 departure with an RNAV in parentheses. And that's how you know that a DP is designed for use with a GPS. Now, SIDs, which are always graphical, are either pilot nav DPs or vector DPs. The pilot nav DPs specify a specific route, where essentially you're going to follow the lines that are printed on the chart. It contains uh, the initial set of instructions for all the routes. And then once you get to the transition area, it has branches that go off into different uh, directions at the fix for which the entire departure procedure is usually named. So, for example, I mentioned the Sunil 9 uh, departure from San Jose. There's going to be one route leaving from the airport to get to Sunil. And then at Sunil, it's going to branch out to various transitions that go in different directions. Now, it's usually to your advantage to file a DP in a transition if there's one going your way. You might be given radar vectors to take you from the runway to the beginning of the DP. But most importantly, graphic pilot DPs are in your database if you have a panel-mounted IFR GPS with a current database. And that lets you easily load these graphic DPs into your flight plan. And in most cases, your autopilot will follow all the left-right turns in the DP, though also in most cases, it will not automatically climb and level off for you. So you're going to have to read the DP chart really carefully. And each time a climb is called for, program your autopilot to climb. Now, vector DPs are very different. The chart looks similar at first glance to a pilot nav DP, except it usually only shows VORs and fixes with no lines interconnecting the, uh, the VORs and the fixes. So they don't show you any particular path to follow. Instead, ATC provides radar vectors from just after takeoff until you reach some assigned route or fix on the chart. 
So given that, it shouldn't surprise you that you're not going to find vector DPs in your IFR-capable GPS because they wouldn't tell you where to go anyway. So you won't be able to load these procedures. You will want to read the text if you're issued one of these procedures as it's going to include an initial set of instructions such as the heading to fly or the initial altitude. But more importantly, they're going to include a loss comp procedure in the text. And that's important since there are no lines to follow on the chart. So if you lose communication, you won't won't know what to do unless you've read the loss comp procedure that's printed on the chart. Now, ODPs are usually found at smaller airports and often at airports that don't have any other published SIDs. They're usually text and they never appear in your panel mounted IFR GPS, so you won't be able to load them as instrument procedures. However, you can sometimes manually load parts of them or all of them by loading the individual fixes listed in the ODP. And if you're instructed to fly a particular course to or from an AV aid, you can usually use that using the GPS's OBS key, though that's, uh, that's non trivial. That's something you're going to need a little practice with before you do it. ODPs provide obstruction clearance via the least onerous route from the terminal area to the appropriate in route structure, and they're recommended for obstruction clearance. And they, by the way, can be flown without an ATC clearance, unless, of course, you've been assigned a SID or radar vectors, and then you can't use the, uh, the ODP. ODPs are published when necessary for airports with instrument approaches. In the government charts, you'll find all textual DPs in the front of the book. And the little T inside the black triangle on an approach plate chart alerts you to look for a textual DP. In Jeppesen's, the textual DPs are uh, in with the approach plates. They're usually on the back side of the first approach chart for each airport. Textual DPs usually are not assigned, and you must determine if one exists and then use it. So, for example, you may want to use them during your initial climb so that you can safely arrive at the MEA of your initial airway if you weren't assigned any other type of uh, departure procedure. Now, if you're not issued a DP or you're not using an ODP, you might get a radar controlled departure. Now, these are really simple and they don't have any charts or textual descriptions. For radar departure, after takeoff, contact departure control on the assigned frequency when the control tower tells you to. And then at that time, departure control will verify that they have radar contact on you. And then they'll give you headings and altitudes and climb instructions so that you can climb quickly and safely out of the terminal area. Now, a pilot is expected to fly whatever headings and altitudes uh, you've been given by uh, the controller uh, until you're told then who to contact next or until you're told to resume own navigation. So basically, departure control provides vectors to either a navigation facility or an in route position that's appropriate for your clearance or until they transfer you to another controller. And while you're under radar control, you really need to monitor your instruments to ensure that you're constantly aware of exactly where you're located or relative to your clearance. Now, if you're using an RNAV DP, your GPS receiver must be set to the terminal mode, which is going to be plus and minus one nautical mile sensitivity of the CDI scale. And the navigation route must be contained in the database in order to fly the published IFR charted departure and DPs. A RAM should be provided automatically by the receiver, and certain segments of a DP may require some manual intervention by the pilot, either to suspend it or unsuspend it, especially when radar vectored to a course that's required to intercept a specific course to a waypoint. Now, the database may not contain all of the transitions or departures from all runways, and some GPS receivers do not contain DPs in the database. It is necessary, this by the way is something new to me, that helicopters procedures must be flown at 70 knots or less, since helicopter departure procedures and missed approaches use a 20 to 1 obstacle clearance surface, which is double the 41 surface that fixed wing aircraft use. And the turning areas for helicopters are also based on the speed. So you got to be 70 knots or less if you're flying a departure procedure in a, a helicopter. Now, here are a few uh, tips and tricks I wanted to pass along. When you're loading an instrument flight plan into a panel-mounted GPS, I recommend that you always load the elements of the flight plan in the order that they appear in your clearance. So if there's a SID in your clearance, you're going to first put in your departure airport, then load the SID, and after that, load your en route waypoints, and finally put in your destination. The reason I recommend that is that I have seen times when a SID will not load properly when it's the last thing that's been loaded or if it's you know, loaded out of order. Specifically, what I've seen is that the active leg can be incorrect in the SID, so the GPS is 
not giving course guidance for the first step in the SID, but perhaps instead for the second step or a later step in the SID. And to solve that problem, the only thing I've been able to do is just delete the entire flight plan, start over from scratch, and enter everything in order. And when I do that, the first leg of the SID will be the active leg as it should be when you're getting ready to depart. To load a SID on most of the Garmin GPSs, you just typically press the PROC key, then you'll select Load Departure, and then press the Enter key. It's then going to present you with a list of departure procedure names for your airport. Just select the proper departure procedure name and press the Enter key. Then what you're going to have to do is select the transition that you've been cleared for. As I mentioned before, SIDs will typically depart from the airport along a common path until they reach the fix for which the procedure was named. And at that point, they're going to split off into multiple transitions that go into different directions. Now, your clearance will list the transition that you've been cleared to follow, and you'll select it in the Garmin GPS and then press the Enter key. Finally, you'll need to select the runway from which you're departing and press the Enter key, and that completes the loading of the SID. Now, here's something I've learned from looking at the callback newsletter. That's the newsletter put out by the NASA ASRS program, which analyzes reports from pilots who've encountered issues when they're flying. The newsletter reports that some flight management systems will not correctly modify a departure procedure after it's been entered into the FMS. So, for example, if the departure runway changes after the procedure has been entered and a flight crew modifies the runway, the DP might not update properly. Therefore, NASA's guidance is that whenever you need to change a DP after you load it, that you should delete the DP and enter it all over again. And another callback article mentioned that some flight crews were failing to fly DPs properly if there were two intermediate level off altitudes that were relatively close to each other. They said that crews often missed the first level off and continued on up to the second altitude. Now, Brian asked how to quickly use and perceive a departure procedure. I've got to tell you, my experience is that there's nothing quick about perceiving and using DPs. Each one is different, and all of them demand that you read them carefully, including all the notes. And frankly, I find that I often need to spend more time understanding a departure procedure than I need with an instrument procedure for an ILS to land at an airport. Generally, each departure procedure has a different beginning, and that depends upon which runway you've been assigned to take off from. So I start by reading the instructions next to the runway number that I've been assigned to depart from. After that, I'm looking for the altitudes at each step of the way, since while the GPS will make the various turns I need to follow the SID, I'm responsible for correctly identifying the altitudes needed at every step of the way. So, for example, an initial altitude may be to cross a fix at or below 3,000 feet, and I'll know that because there will be a horizontal bar above the fix name, which indicates that I need to be below that specified altitude. Later, I might need to cross at or above, say, 7,000 feet, and I'll know that because the horizontal bar will be under the fix in the altitude, indicating that I need to be above that minimum altitude. And if there's a fix where I need to cross at an exact altitude, then there will be horizontal bars both above and below the fix name and altitude, indicating that I have to cross that fix at that exact altitude. Now, a key thing to remember when you're flying the correct altitudes of a SID is that during that process, you might be told to level off at some intermediate altitude that's lower than the published altitudes on the SID. So you won't always be able to just climb to each of the altitudes specified. Instead, you really need to listen carefully for any of these intermediate altitudes that are issued by the controller that are going to force you to level off, even though the SID states that you could be at a higher altitude at that point. Now, when you're listening to the controller, you want to listen carefully for the phrase, climb via your departure name. That's the instruction that's going to delete all prior altitude level offs, and it's going to finally allow you to follow all of the steps up depicted in the climb. Now, Brian mentioned that he's sometimes surprised when a SID is issued. Here are a couple of ways you can figure out in advance if you might get a SID. If you're using an app like ForeFlight, just enter your destination and departure airports into the flight plan section of the app. Then use the route advisor to see what ATC routings have been previously issued to other aircraft that are flying the same route. And if you see a SID listed in one or more or all of those routes, well, that's the SID you're likely to be assigned when you get your clearance. And if there aren't any previously cleared routes in the route advisor, check to see whether there are any DPs listed in your charts for your departure airport. 
If there are none, well, of course, you're not going to be issued a SID. And if there are SIDs listed, well, go ahead and review each of them to see if any of them go in the direction that you're planning to travel, which may give you a small clue as to which SID you might be issued. And if you're at a small airport that doesn't have any SIDs, check to see whether the airport has an ODP. If it does, you'll probably want to use that ODP as a safe way to climb to reach the first airway in your clearance. Now, here's just one final thought on IFR departures. Sometimes aircraft will depart in VFR and try to pick up their IFR clearance in the air as a way to save some time or if they can't reach the departure frequency from the ground. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing this if the weather is good, but if the weather is marginal, man, this is a trap that you probably want to avoid. There have been multiple accidents where an aircraft took off VFR but struck terrain in bad weather while waiting for their IFR clearance in the air from ATC, and one of those accidents occurred occurred to an FAA-owned aircraft, so if it could happen to them, it could happen to you as well, too. I will say that IFR departures from smaller airports can be tricky, and you'll want to spend all the time necessary to understand all of your options for departing that airport, and you'll want to fully understand every detail of any SIDS you've been assigned, which can take a lot of time. There really are no shortcuts when flying IFR, and of course, the stakes are really, really high if you make a mistake. So I encourage everybody to take whatever time is necessary to make sure that you fully understand your clearance and never hesitate to contact a controller before you leave the ground if you have any question about your clearance. Now, just in the last six months, I have done that twice. Uh, once when I was departing from Santa Monica near LA and a couple of weeks ago while departing Addison in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And in both cases, I had questions about the departure procedure, trying to figure out exactly exactly how it was going to mesh with the uh, clearance that I had after the DP. Anyway, it's just a heck of a lot easier to figure out things while you're still on the ground, when you're nice and calm and collected than it is once you're up in the air and struggling to comprehend what it is you're supposed to do next. So that's what I've got to share on departure procedures. If you have any tips or tricks you'd like to share, please send me an email or an audio recording. As I mentioned before, if you have the Apple Podcast app, just tap on the artwork in the top half of your screen to see the show notes, which include a link for emailing me. Or if you have one of my dedicated apps for the Aviation News Talk podcast that you can find in the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, you can just swipe up to get to the show notes. In these podcast apps, all three of them, the links are live, and you can just click on the email link to send me an email. Now, if you're using some other podcast app, well, not all the links are live in all apps because uh, the app developer doesn't happen to support live links in their app. So if that's the case and you check the show notes and you can't find any links to click on, just open up a web browser and type in aviationnewstalk.com, click on send an email at the top of the page, and you can contact me. And coming up next, lots of listener feedback and questions. One listener said his private pilot training did a great job of preparing him to get the certificate, but fell well short of preparing him to be a real-world pilot. We'll tell you why in just a minute. Stick around. And welcome back. We'll get to listener questions in just one minute. But first, I want to thank E. Burendorf for leaving a review in the Apple Podcast app, formerly called iTunes. And this was kind of interesting. I'm going to read the review. I don't usually read uh, full reviews, but it did uh, bring up an interesting issue. He said in the title, Thought May 13th was the last episode. And then he said, From the end of March through April to May 23rd, I thought the March 13th episode was the last of the podcast. First thought, Max was too busy to record due to travel and work. Then I heard him on Airplane Geeks this week, and someone gave him kudos for this show. When viewing the available episodes on the Apple Podcast app, March 13th under Season 1 appears at the top. The latest episodes actually are way down below Season 1, which I didn't realize after two months. Great show, Max. Well, I exchanged a number of emails uh, with this gentleman, and what we discovered is, first of all, he had not subscribed to the show. And that's because he's been listening to podcasts for many years. And back then, the cell phones that people had really didn't have a lot of storage space. So he didn't subscribe so that the episodes would not download onto his phone. And that's still the way he listens to them today. He just goes to a show and clicks on it rather than subscribe and having the episodes automatically downloaded. And what I will tell you is I strongly encourage you to click the subscribe button for a couple of reasons. One, you're going to see all the episodes and they're going to be in the correct order. Uh, so unlike what this gentleman saw, you're going to see uh, everything, uh, you know, neatly installed every week. Uh, and the other reason that it makes sense to subscribe is that uh, the iTunes app 
basically looks at how many new subscribers subscribe each week, and then it moves us up in the rankings. So if you're not subscribing and you are listening, just click the subscribe button uh, because that will move us up further in the iTunes ranking, which means other people are going to be more likely to find this show. And I'd like to encourage uh, people to go on out and leave reviews for us, especially because I'd like to see a new review in place of this one right here because it leaves people with the impression that there's uh, something wrong with uh, the show. So anyway, we learned something from that. And uh, now let's move on to listener feedback. This comes from Bruce. He said, hi, Max, something that I thought would make a good episode or perhaps a semi-regular segment on multiple episodes comes from my own experience. My PPL training, I think, did a great job of preparing me to get the certificate. However, I think it fell well short of preparing me to be a real-world pilot. As a few examples, once I started venturing out on my own, I quickly learned that I had no idea how to use a self-service fuel pump. I didn't know the right way to approach them, how to use them, or the general etiquette surrounding them. And when taxing up to an FBO, I didn't know what that guy in the vest was doing, waving those orange sticks around. He says, okay, I did have an idea, but uh, didn't know any of the nuances of being marshaled. Or at an airport without a marshal, where were the appropriate places to park? And are you expected to tip? If so, to whom, under what circumstances, and again, what is generally appropriate? When you call up an FBO before a trip, what information do you like to get, and what would you want them to provide? So I guess what I'm suggesting is a discussion of the ins and outs of being a member of the community without having to learn everything by trial and error beyond their certificate, so to speak. So perhaps I was just slow on the uptake, but I wonder if this sort of thing may help other new pilots become more comfortable and encouraged to venture out more or teach veterans a different way to do things. Keep up the great work, Bruce. Bruce, I think this is really an excellent comment, and I agree with you. Many of these little nuances are not talked about uh, during private pilot training, and people have to just figure them out. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to ask people to send us their feedback. What did you learn after you got your pilot certificate that was important that you wish you'd learned during your private pilot certificate? So I'm going to encourage people to make audio recordings. Let's get these to me by the end of July. So July 31st will be the last day to send these to me. Uh, just use a voice memo on your iPhone and then send an email with that uh, audio to info at sjflight.com, short for San Jose flight.com, or you can go out to our uh, website, aviationnewstalk.com, click on listener question, and you can record there using the SpeakPike app. Now let's go to our listener questions. Hi, Max. This is Larry in the East Bay, and I have a question for you. I found my original logbooks from 40 years ago, and I'm just curious as to how flight training has changed over the last 40 years. And looking at my first 10 flights, we were doing a lot of stick and rudder work, uh, spin training, lots of stall work, emergency landings to the height of a sleeping cow. Um, a lot of crosswind work, and uh, just wondering how things have changed. Uh, I remember uh, being fearful of the question in, in a uh, a non headset Cessna 150 when the instructor would shout, "Where are we?" and uh, that brought out the charts and <laughs> all sorts of different ways of finding our locations. Uh, now it's followed the magenta line. Just wondered what your opinions were. Uh, and thank you for having a, a wonderful podcast. Everybody enjoys it. I'm glad to see the ratings are high and the reviews are wonderful. Thank you again, Max. Bye. Larry, thanks for your question. Boy, I haven't seen you for years, and it's great to hear from you. It brings back a lot of good memories of our time uh, flying together, taking volunteer doctors and dentists to, down to Mexico. So initially when I got your question, I thought, hmm, I don't think things have changed that much. And as I listened to it again more carefully, I thought, well, actually, a number of things have. I think one issue is that I think that we're still using the same kind of pilot training that we used back in World War II. And the goal there was to turn out pilots as quickly as possible and get them off to war. And unfortunately, I think that we probably could use uh, more emphasis uh, these days on risk management 
things like that, uh, because I think that's a big area that even today still gets left out of pilot training a little bit too much. Uh, but you mentioned uh, learning to fly in a Cessna 150 with no headsets. Yep, me too. That's exactly the way that I learned it. And there was a lot of uh, shouting that went back and forth. So these days, everybody use headsets. So that's a big difference in training uh, right there. You mentioned a lot of spin training in your first 10 hours. <laughs> now there's a huge difference there. Uh, spin training hasn't been required in the U.S. since probably around 1960. Uh, so your instructor uh, back, I'm guessing, in the early 70s was uh, still doing something that had been required 10 years before. Uh, and in fact, my instructor did demonstrate a spin to me uh, when I learned over 40 years ago, but there was not a lot of uh, you know, repetition to it. We just did it one time. Of course, these days, if you're doing any spin training, the law says you must have a parachute, <laughs> not for the airplane like a Cirrus, but you strapped on your back when you're out there doing spin training. And I hear a lot of stories of people who are doing spin training without parachutes. That's strictly illegal except for one circumstance, and that's if you are training for a certificate that requires spin training, and the only one that does is CF certificate. So if you're trying to be a CFI, you can do spin training without parachutes. Otherwise, you need a parachute. I think some other things are probably that it's taking longer to solo people than it used to, uh, probably just because, uh, you know, there are more rules and regulations and TFRs and all kinds of things to teach people. So it takes them a little bit longer to get ready to solo. I also think that there are some instructors who are now focusing on teaching things like for flight. Uh, I don't do that. I think that the basics of flying are, are more important and that people can usually figure out what they need to know about for flight on their own. I know there are other, there's a uh, differ in that view. I heard an instructor recently say that he thinks that teaching for flight is an absolutely essential thing in teaching uh, pilot training. So obviously uh, we differ sometimes on, on that. One thing that has changed is I think that the oral portion of the private check ride has gotten significantly harder than it used to be. So I think we spend a lot more time preparing people uh, for the oral than we used to, uh, simply because that's now become a harder part of the uh, the test to pass. And I think those are probably some of the major differences. But if uh, there are other people out there who have other ideas, uh, definitely send me feedback and we'll include that uh, in a future show. Hey there, Max. My name is Matt. I'm a student pilot in the Los Angeles area and the newest, biggest fan of your show. I recently was playing around on ForeFlight and stumbled upon a T-route while constructing a mock flight plan from Los Angeles up to the Bay Area. Now, this wasn't a term that I was familiar with, and upon further research found that a pilot needs to be instrument equipped and on an IFR flight plan to fly on the T-route. My question for you is, are VFR pilots allowed to construct a flight plan that includes or even operate on a T-route in the first place? They're not shown on VFR sectionals or tacks, so how would a VFR pilot be expected to avoid the T-routes using conventional methods if they're intended to be used by instrument traffic? Thanks a lot for the show and for all the great insight. I'm always looking forward to the next episode. Keep up the great work. Hey, Matt, thanks so much for the question. Now, you said that uh, pilots must be on an IFR flight plan to fly on a T-route. I'm kind of interested where you came across that. I have never heard that before. I did some quick research here, couldn't find it. So I don't think that's the case. Uh, because uh, you mentioned a couple of different things. How would pilots avoid it? I think that's a big issue right there. The T-routes are only published on the low altitude and route to IFR charts. Uh, so that's the way anybody could find them. But if you're only flying with VFR charts, you wouldn't know where they are. Uh, the information uh, guide for this comes from uh, Aeronautical Information Manual uh, 5-3-4. and They talk about uh, published RNAV routes, including Q routes and T routes. They say they can be flight planned for use by aircraft with RNAV capability. Note that would be any aircraft with RNAV capability. So they don't say specifically just IFR uh, aircraft. They do say it's subject to any limitations or requirements noted on in-route charts and applicable ACs or by NOTAM. So I don't see any limitations at all for anybody to fly a T-route, except that they have to have a GPS uh, capability in the aircraft. Now, T-routes are available for use by uh, GPS or GPS WASD equipped aircraft from 1,200 feet above the surface up to, but not including, 18,000 feet MSL. Above 18,000 MSL, the equivalent uh, GPS routes would be called Q-routes, and those go all the way up to flight level Four five zero. So I think the simple answer to your question is sure. Anybody can fly on a T route at any time, uh, and you don't have to be instrument equipped to do that. 
That's all the time we have for questions today. If you think you might someday buy a new or slightly used Cirrus, please contact me now. I can help arrange a free demo flight if you're thinking about a new Cirrus. And I can certainly help you understand the many factors and all the trade-offs in buying new versus used. I specialize in the Cirrus and work with people around the country. Also, if you enjoy the show, take a minute and go visit our Patreon page at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And finally, if you have a friend you think might enjoy this show, please tell them how to subscribe. In fact, take their iPhone from them or their cell phone and show them how to do it. And if they're not real tech-oriented, just go ahead and send them over to the App Store, either for Android or iOS. And in there, you can search for Aviation News Talk and find a copy of our dedicated app. And until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up.